and Shoreditch, um, as the lights go on on the horizon outside, on such a beautiful day, what an appropriate um, spring day for us to launch um, Exploring Radical Female Joy. Um, I'm Catherine McCormack. Um, I've curated this 12-month program uh, with UNIT London and with the help of Francesca Andrews, who's been um, an incomparable, her, you know, just sort of force in mobilising this. Um, so to start off, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the inspiration for this program before we had some spoken words um, from Molly at the end here, and the panel discussion kicks off with my wonderful panellists. So, um, exploring radical female joy. Um, I was writing my book, Women in the Picture, which came out last year, um, and in one chapter of that, I was thinking about the visibility of images of violence against women, um, the way we're so familiar with female trauma, um, the way in which that is a currency sometimes in the fashion industry, thinking about fashion photography campaigns, um, thinking about the familiarity of female pain in the media, especially women of colour's pain. Um, and within that, I started to think what would happen if we continued to bear witness to that, but then also flooded our cultural networks with images of joy and women's pleasure, and female pleasure. What kind of society would that be? What kind of, how would that change our relationship with ourselves, how we see ourselves, how we see one another? Um, and so I suppose as part of that, um, it's really important to recognize that talking about joy tonight in February 2022 might feel in some ways a little bit perverse if we, whatever we've been scrolling in the news and the way here is unspeakable levels of violence, unspeakable brutality um, across the world, not least in the Ukrainian crisis. And of course, we came up with the idea for this program at the end of last year, and it was meant to be uh, sort of released from the pandemic and COVID, and a way of taking a, a breath of fresh air and thinking about joy at the end of a traumatic, deeply traumatic period. Um, so then I was thinking, how do we match up joy with brutality? Um, and I really just hate you with that after having such a wonderful mariachi band. Um, and this expression of joy and, and sort of spirited fiesta, how do we match up those two things? And I suppose that's what I'm really interested in in this programme. How do we make joy the other side of violence and brutality and trauma? Um, or what does it mean to mobilise joy in that way? How can we make joy political? Um, and of course, this is not something that I've come up with on my own. I'm drawing on the rich heritage of already well-established movements around joy activism, pleasure activism, black joy, um, collectives of joy. Um, so that's just an idea of what the starting point for this whole program. Um, so after this evening, a lot of the content will be, a lot of the programming will move to online events, reading groups, um, studio visits, but we'll also be having some other in-person events throughout the year, um, and um, I can talk a little bit more maybe later about other themes we'll be tackling. Um, but back to you this evening, I'm delighted to introduce Amarna Saeed, who is going to start off this evening with a spoken word performance. Um, Amarna is from the Yogiverse Collective of South Asian Female Poets. Um, and she's going to give us um, her set tonight, and then she's going to be joining our panel. Hi. <laughs> Do you know what? I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> I made that all really intense. No, 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 no. no, no. Oh, I think it's really funny to be introduced as a poet sometimes because everyone's like, Ooh, they've got something really deep to say. And I'm just like, yo, I wrote this while I was on my period. And then I memorized it on the train and it looked like someone kind of like not with it. I think I scared a couple of people today. I'm um, just like on the train here being like, you're trying to memorize all my stuff. Um, I'm with you. I don't know if I feel particularly joyful right now, even though I sound very upbeat. That's just how I sound. What comes with the American accent, I guess. 
Um, but I guess, what do you expect in the product? I'm wearing all black. I've got some boots. Um, it's probably all you're going to get. Um, I guess, if we're talking about joy, and I'm thinking about what this interesting position is of opening up a night about joy and thinking, putting some pressure on myself of, God, I need to sound really upbeat. I need to sound really with it. I need to lift some energy. I'm not a hype band, you know? Um, actually, I just came from work. This whole week and the whole last week, I've been working till midnight a couple days. I've got multiple hustles, capitalism, um, <laughs> and it's been a long ass week. So what I'm not gonna do is that toxic positivity thing of being like, yeah, I'm really good right now. Um, I'm on the edge of joy. You know, I'll let you feel it. I won't sing for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but all I can promise is to be honest, because actually maybe one of the most important things about joy is that it's something you can't fake something you can't hide. Um, I've been trying to smile at people, I've been trying to be there, it's not reaching my eyes quite, I'm gonna practice it and see if I can get there at some point. But we're gonna take it really easy, come on in, take a seat, don't be awkward, please. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of spaces there if you want them, that's your chance. There you go, come on, get comfy. That's important too. And yeah, we're not gonna make this too deep, you may or may not learn something new, you may or may not think that this is any good, you don't have to share some thoughts with you. Does that sound okay? Yeah. <laughs> You're really feeling my energy right now and I've got it with you. So I was talking to Catherine about this essay which I think is on the back of your pamphlet. It's a part of its printed. It's called The Laughter from the Blue Sky by Her Institute. And I loved that essay when I learned about it at university um, because it was about a new kind of writing for women, or rather a writing that's always been there, but that you haven't acknowledged in a specific way or in the patriarchal society. Um, and there's something about when you're a woman, or when you are leaning into femininity in any notion, um, I'm trying to stay away from gender essentialism and biology and, this, and how I speak about womanhood and femininity, whatever that means, it's quite arbitrary, you know. And <laughs> what I loved about that essay was this notion of monstrosity, that a woman's laughter, a woman's pleasure, a woman's joy, is quite monstrous because we're not used to it. And there's a poem that I wrote, and it's about being a Muslim woman, and it's about how you can never win because everyone's always got an opinion over your body and how you dress, and how you can even begin to navigate that. And it's a long story, I hope you so. I'll have an answer to if I need. <laughs> Watch your back. Watch your friend. Watch the sister at the end of the tube carriage rocking back and forth in the felt seat with a BuzzFeed ready between her fingers. Nobody notices when that piece of this. Leave a three-person radius around the hijabi with the backpack standing well back from the platform edge in case Tommy comes by raking a baseball bat over the white tiles. I spy with my little eye her iPhone screen. She's popping the coins in the machine. But I guess you don't notice our assimilation our interpretations of cultures, how we crush the meshes in between our fingers like border fences, how we stitch hybrid flags from the ripped seams of our partitioned lands, how we finesse the spices the colonizers could steal but never seem to learn how to use the season. We integrate the taste of home into your bread dishes, then start washing up over the kitchen sink, wistfully wishing for some nostalgic rewind with the diasporic ticker tape to a time when a lot of for stone like that is great and then turn you into a walking pipe bomb. Oh, when the hair is poking at your hijab didn't become straight copper wires, when men didn't magnify their desire of sweating for muscular computer screens, yeah, baby, come for me, come for me, girl, come for me. Even when men lower their gazes, somehow they still manage to make our bodies obscene. Our hips are vilified, and our lighter tights and split thighs become excuses for them to hide in. As if my sinning justifies yours. Still, it seems no matter who's doing the looking, our wounds are hunting grounds for graveyards. We're crucified in our own weaponized bodies and I have a mother. Women have always written their histories in white ink, so I don't think that you can read me now, look at me now. I'll turn you to stone. Damn by the West if I cover up, damn by God if I don't. I'll succumb and play monster for you. Succubus to your fallible protagonist, Calypso to your Odysseus. My laugh is the Medusa, so you better cover your ears. My serrated giggle splintering your hubris. I'm the burning stake in the Cyclops' eye. I'm Artemis transforming Actaeon into a stag. I am the single iris shared between three hags, still scrying the future with perfect clarity, and baby, I bring it's hellfire because karma. She's a bitch. Three bitches. Four 
bitches, five bitches, a whole line of bitches walking shackle free, cackling their bitch cackles hysterically because they could foresee a line of queens that never would have been if not for the misery you inflicted. And you had convicted us from our bodies, our homes, we were the living ghosts coming to collect alimony for two years to live. Coming to collect the education we stole from child brides at 15. Coming to collect the half-finished degrees. Coming to collect these very baby girls. Blessed be that unborn chorus of voices who wouldn't have been allowed to speak, let alone to scream. Blessed be those invisible women who have somehow still flourished like leaves. We are overgrown, even. Take that in your head. Break down. continent across a couple of countries in the Middle East. And it's always a bit of flux. And people often think, you know, you have to pick a side, you have to choose no limit effect, you have to say whether you're American, you're British, you're Pakistani, Indian, Kashmiri, whatever. And actually there's a real power and wonder. I don't know if I've used the term joy just yet, but there's something brilliant in being able to have the all of these things at once. And there's a pleasure in that, in having joy. So that's what this poem's about. And it's called Chai Tea, and if you know, you know. <laughs> I was told to write my own truths. Somehow, being brown has always wanted me. But I don't want to tell you about being a brown girl. I don't speak for brown girls. It is like we assume white individuality, how we separate those shades of pearl, alabaster, cream. There are different shades of chai, coffee, tea. When I speak, I speak for me. And let me tell you, I get culture shock every time I look in the mirror. I'm not an ABC, or even a BBC. I'm more of a British-born, American-raised, confused as hell dancer who's got some other kind of ancestry within me but can never be sure of what it is because my nine John Monster copy of the family tree. Fuck me. <laughs> I just don't want it. When God made me, they took the tea bag out to a room. I'm nipping a date who didn't listen to Auntie G when they made that fateful morning cup of chai, tried to find a way to avoid wastage, and instead basted my skin with it. My mom painted this semi-toasted tin I can't quite name, holding up a Pantone color chart and praying my shades on her somewhere. So I burst into this world with my ever so slightly stained skin, I'm asked the inevitable question, where do you really come from? As if I know. While all my brown friends call India the motherland, I think I must be adopted. How could it be my motherland that didn't birth me if I've never even seen it firsthand? Shout out to Salman Rushdie for teaching me that my homeland is imaginary because it ain't really my homeland. And even my mother's homeland. And even my mother's mother's homeland. Not really. Nanijan was taken from India at 15 and arranged into marriage with a full grown man. Kenya, the next homeland for my mother, and then Helmslow. Brownsville of London, in an attached house with pink walls where I was born and brought to America. Homeland number three. But now I've got this accent. <laughs> These friendships, this family that spans oceans, this ancestry that circles the whole globe, I am perplexed when the poem is home. And that it's borderless. And there's nobody who can tell me what I am because there's nobody who can tell me what I'm not. I span hot desert winds and have the body biryani, calligraphic inscriptions and swimming competitions, songs with clotted cream and jam and advanced placement exams, shalwar kameez that love my curved hips and Abercrombie jeans that just won't sit over them. Masala dosas, samosas, mimosas, Arabic lessons, Saturday detentions, text messages, varsity jackets, empty Cadbury packets. I'm that one international multicultural package wrapped up in brown paper, tied up with white string. My song is strewn all over this earth. So you better believe that the next time somebody asks me where I'm really from, I'll just tell them I come from home. Last one. Last one. And then we have for more incredible women. 
So this has both, again, I lost about being Muslim in here, just because, wow, what a time to be a Muslim woman. <laughs> and what a country to be a Muslim woman in. Uh, there's something about modesty and about the way people look at us and about the way our bodies are consumed and judged. And there's so much discourse about us and around us. But we are so ready and bold. So this poem is about that. I want to make. I want to feel my hair swish past my knees as I fall down to sludge that I'm frustrated. And I want to feel the skin of my knees frozen to ferment as I raise myself to thank the poor God. I want to thumb through a copy of the Quran bare-legged in bed. The summer breeze eating through the window scented of jasmine. This dusty city honking and humming and profaning its holiness and laundry as I leave. And I want to fake it in the masjid that keeps me in the back because who says I'm not going to get distracted by the men bending over? I try to avert my gaze, demonstrate how to behave for the halal brothers who insist on the hem of my trousers being lowered, and I just need to manage to lower their gazes. I want to pray drunk. I want to send a 5 a.m. text to God because that's when I need God the most, when I've been drinking and fucking my demons away, extracting strength from the men I split open in my bed, pulling power from each bewitched moan, every twitch, stitching myself back together with their helplessness because perhaps if I just slip my notches in my bed posts, I'll regain control. I won't be subject to this shame, this self-hatred anymore, this disgust that leaves me pink and gutted. I'm not eating. I'm not fucking at it either. I will not repent for this body, this sanctuary, my home. These walls, flesh, this roof, bone, this mind, the sanctuary from all the world telling me how to think, how to be. Cover up your hair when you pray so that men don't gaze upon your beauty. But when I pray alone, I want to pray naked. Like God can't see right through my clothes when I bend over to touch my toes. Like God can't see right through my clothes when I'm before a man on my knees. Like I am degraded by being naked in front of God when God has only seen my knees. And as I stand before my mirror, I am awed, alhamdulillah. This body was created strong. These legs have kicked and swung and run. These hands have held and been held and loved. These lips have kissed, prayed, sung. I am sex and a jar of ice, a glass of whiskey and the holy Quran. I am the shape-shifting, pulsating heart of a Venn diagram. I contain all of it. And I'm ashamed. sexuality, spirituality, I made loads more notes, exoticism, diaspora, um, the female gaze, you've given us so much and I know that there's lots of strands that I think we're going to pick up with speaking to my other two wonderful panel members, Adelaide Moa, artist and co-founder of Infirms Collective and also Daniela Gallan, music curator and founder of um, Latin American Women Artists Network. And I am, exactly. <laughs> no, not Instagram, it's not a very common artist. Um, okay, so we're going to kick off our discussion, um, which we will try to keep within the time, and then hopefully we'll allow it at the end, um, and I'm sure there will be plenty. So, um, shall we start with, I think we might have an image of Adelaide's work. Is that a good place to start for you, Adelaide? Um, so, your recent exhibition at your German gallery, which was at the end of last year, wasn't it? 2021 was actually called Radical Joy. Um, so I wanted to start off by just asking you how Radical Joy informs your art practice um, and also how that relates into wider histories of black joy and female sexuality. Big question. I know you can handle it, Adelaide. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. I said it all. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, start with, let's just start with the painting then. 
Okay, let's talk with how to learn to enjoy deep and compatible practice. Yeah. How, what was the steps to bringing, making that the title and encapsulating your work within those terms? Okay, so um, I've been practicing for like 17 years and up until 2020, and we all know what happened in 2020, I was really focused very much on speaking to colonialism, feminism, sometimes spirituality, and so all of the you know light subjects, and uh, and that was that felt important for me to do, but I'm sure that most of you are aware that when it comes to black artists creating work, there's this there's this there's this feeling of um, pressure, right? Like your representation, uh -huh. yeah. Um, Which is Kavina Mercer's essay. Exactly. Like taking notes. Um, whereby we feel, some of us feel, not all of us, um, like you said, I, I can't speak for all black women, I can't speak for all black people, I can only speak for myself. Um, and I have personally felt that this pressure to produce work that spoke to very serious topics that related to my identity in order to be taken seriously by the wider art world, right? Um, and that for me felt important and it still feels important. So for example, I, I have an ongoing project which I call my lifetime project, which is called Confronting Colonization. It came out of a performance I did called Into the Mind of the Colonizer, uh, 2019, and the last one I did was 2020, that was very specifically speaking about colonialism um, and riffed on Yoko Ono's 1960 uh, 65 cut piece. It's a whole other conversation. But that work to me is something that I will continue to make um, for the rest of my life. And it's, it feels very, very important still. However, 2020 happened. And at the beginning of 2020, so I had just come out of one of the best years of my life and my career, 2019. And it's weird because I feel like a lot of people have said that 2019 was amazing for them as well. And uh, I had so many performances. I had 10 performances going all over the world. Um, loads of sales and just felt fantastic. I felt like I looked the best I've ever looked in my life. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then here comes 2020. I had amazing performances at the beginning of the year and then all of a sudden get back from Morocco after just the, the most amazing time um, doing a performance and we're in lockdown. My mum gets sick. I got sick. So many other people got sick. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. So I spent some time um, meditating, I spent a lot of time reading, I set up a reading group um, with other people, other like-minded people where we were reading, like things like Franz Fanon. But, um, <laughs> but that kind of sense of community helped me to feel better. Um, and then I, I somehow felt like I wanted to pick up on some work that I had done for a previous project, which was a load of body prints that were really colorful, not colourful as this, but really, really colourful, and um, I just decided to put them up in my studio, and so I put them up in my studio. I'm lucky enough that um, I live very close to my studio, and my studio was open for the whole of lockdown, so I put them up, and I would sit there and contemplate them, and just the colours made me feel so much better, and I became obsessed with hot pink, um, <laughs> and I just started making work just for the pure joy of making work, and and that was what I was saying. I was saying I'm making work for the pure joy of making work, right? Whereas before I was making work because I love making work and I love having those conversations, but there were other, what I felt were more important topics that I felt like I wanted to address. So this felt like um, a rest. It felt like a release, right? Um, and, and then Sakile and me, who are my gallery in Germany, who are just incredible, asked me, what's going on over there? You know, what are you making? Are you making anything? I said, yeah, I'm making this and that. <laughs> I, I felt a bit shy about showing them work, and Sakile said, but you're just showing me work. Um, and so we did a, uh, a Zoom for Zoom studio visit, which was like the thing in 2020. And, um, and she said, I love this work. I want to show the work. I'm like, really? <laughs> not serious, it's like, it's about joy. Joy is serious, hello, joy is serious. Um, and, and, and to be honest, when she said she wanted to give me this, this 
this show at the end of um, 2021, that's probably the most nervous I felt about showing work um, because um, I didn't feel like I had that kind of all that academic stuff backing me. However, however, um, that kind of forced me to really think about what I was doing in a way that I, I, I wasn't thinking about it while I was making it, but that conversation forced me to really think about what I was doing. And that brought me back to Audre Lorde's essay. So Audre Lorde, uh, this, the essay that I'm talking about is Uses the, of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power. And she did this speech in 1978. And that essay, I think I read that essay for the first time maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, and it blew me away then, but I don't think I had the understanding of it that I have now. And when I read that essay, it, 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 it put a different kind of coloring um, and a different kind of way of thinking about joy and accessing joy on the work for me. And so that was where we started our conversation to me. Um, one of our collective members, Dr. Maria Mancio, wrote this incredible essay for me, a catalog of Peggy Ocean also wrote a gorgeous um, piece. So yeah, that's it. You can read us a bit from Audre Lorde, because I know that you have the essay with you. Um, and maybe we can reflect on that a little bit. Um, and then think a bit about this axis of pain and joy, which um, I notice in the title of your work, and maybe we can come to that in a minute, but please read us a, a segment. So this, uh, there, are, there are many, many like mic drop moments in this, in this incredible essay, which has become kind of like a Bible for me, or this that battered, uh, it's become like a, a kind of like a Bible for me, but this specific bit, I think, I feel like it really speaks to what we're talking about this evening. And she says, the erotic function to me in several ways, and the first is implied in the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. The sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them, and lessens the threat of their difference. That, for me, is everything. I think we talked about this briefly before we sat down this evening. Um, and this idea of joy, or, I mean, this idea of joy as a language keeps coming up, whether it's through Amani's performance and her words, this expression of joy within your body that you're putting down on the canvas and thinking about how that ties into your relationship with yourself, but also what you can communicate to others. So I think this idea of joy as a language and one that that supersedes those barriers of difference that have really been set up among us, especially within voices of feminism that are pitted against one another very regularly in you know, various ways by parties interested in you know, suppressing the expansiveness and the potential of women coming together collectively despite their differences, you know, despite where they come from, as Amani's work testifies to, where do any of us come from? Um, so I love that idea in Audre Lorde's work, and it's such a powerful call to, to joy, really, isn't it? Um, can we talk a little bit about this idea of joy and pain that's, that's kind of underneath your work? Because I'm really interested in the idea of joy as not being straightforward and simplified, and happiness, or some platitude, and an expectation, or an injunction, like Amani suggested at the start, you know, maybe are we on the edge of joy and that being okay? Um, never quite reaching joy is also okay, um, instead of some branded, you know, tote bags or sort of Instagram gifts about be happy. Um, can we talk a little bit about joy and pain? Maybe Armani, if you want to, like, contribute to that as well, but I don't know, it's just, um, can you give us a bit of your, your thoughts on that relationship between joy and pain? Yeah, joy and pain, I mean, okay, so a bit of personal information, maybe TMI, but, um, <laughs> so I suffer from a condition called endometriosis, right, which is a, a chronic female condition that affects one in 10 women globally. Um, and uh, it causes intense pain. Uh, it's 
I'm in control now, I'm fine, I'm not gonna react, don't worry. Um, but what it means is that there are times when I have experienced such intense pain that I haven't been able to walk. You know, I've been, I've been in hospital where I've had to be in a wheelchair, I've been in walking, all sorts. It's, it's kind of insane, <laughs> the impact that it can have. So, um, specifically as it relates to this work, um, what we were talking about earlier was the first time when I really became conscious of the connection between joy and pain. And it's biological, actually. There's a neurological connection between pleasure, specifically, and pain, right? Um, and so this can feed into other conversations about SM and all these kinds of things, but specifically as it relates to, to me and my experience, the first time when I kind of consciously accessed this was the time when I'd not long been out of hospital back in 2011. Um, and all of a sudden I was, I was hit with this pain and I was in bed and I didn't know what to do. And at the time, so 2011, I wasn't making any money from my art. And so I was actually doing freelance writing and uh, making money. <laughs> yeah. So I had this client in Australia and I was, I actually was, um, the ghostwriter, the book one really was the programming for them. And they were kind enough to send me this book um, and the CD that was speaking about meditation. And the, the, the CD-ROM was, I don't know if any of you have heard of binaural beats, mm -hmm. which are supposed to slow down your brain waves in, in meditation. Um, so it can either be where there's a beat playing or it could be where the, there's a speaker who's talking you down um, so that you get to a deeper level of mind and you can access um, creativity, you can kind of heal yourself from pain. Um, and so on this occasion, my interest was on eliminating the pain, right? And so I did this and I just let myself go. And words, I was trying to explain it earlier to, to Catherine. It's very difficult to put into words what I experienced. But uh, if I went from being in this crippling pain to feeling like I was floating in space where there was no pain, where I was enveloped in pure love and joy. And this work um, is one of, of many where they, they come from a chapter in this series of work called Heavenly Bodies because to me they look like heavenly bodies uh, floating in space. And that's how I felt in that moment. But specifically relating to, to this work, um, which I produced last year, I spent all of 2021 writing lots of love poetry um, about somebody really special. And um, I had a dream one night, one night when I was in pain, not in any way near as bad pain as the, the pain of that first instance, but it was, it was serious enough that I had to take some painkillers. So I had this, this really insane, intense dream that was highly, highly sexual, right? <laughs> yeah, it was highly sexual. And it, it shocked me because I had never, when I had that situation before, it wasn't sexual, right? It was, it was something else, it was something completely otherworldly, it was something spiritual. Whereas this felt like a, a real kind of embodiment, an embodied experience that um, took me out of the pain and allowed me to access pleasure and joy, actually, within the pain. So the pain was still there. And that was mind-blowing. And, um, and so I woke up and immediately had to write down exactly what happened in the dream. Um, and, and so those series of poems that I wrote over that year, lines from some of those poems have become the titles of this work. And they all speak to desire, um, and pain. There's one that is called, um, there's one that is called, there's a kind of violence in my desire for you. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a complicated human thing that uh, I, I felt for the first time 
free to speak about the night and the light. I think it's just um, this access of pain and joy, I think is really these intensities of experience which are often um, foreclosed for non-visual language that as you as you kind of spoken about the pressure for women of colour as art to be about their trauma or to be speaking with a collective voice for all women or all people of colour. Um, and this space to explore the individuality of like corporeal physical experience. It made me think about Amani's praying while naked and your, the sensation of your hair and your body and being in your body and that idea of praying also having a sensual corporeal aspect to it um, and how that, it seems to be so taboo within religious constructions of how women should behave within religion or within whatever form of spirituality they find affinity with. Um, I don't know, did you have any any things to elaborate on that one? No, I was just, I really liked Andrea's point about sort of pain and joy not being binaristic, but rather very much part and parcel of each other. Well said. And mm. also about it being almost transcendental, like especially in that celestial element that you're talking about and looking at your work. God, I hope that's really big. You know, yeah. I hope that work is so big <laughs> that you can just kind of look at it and get lost in it as well. And I mean, what you made me think of that relate actually was how common that experience is of like pain and pleasure being not even two sides of the same coin, but just part and parcel of each other. And I go back to what you said at the beginning, Catherine, about it might seem strange to talk about joy right now in a time where the world is at war. And I think what's interested me about this and all this closure, I work in equity, diversity, and inclusion, and I've had so many thoughts about the way we are talking about this war and about Ukraine and Russia and how suddenly we care when there are so many other wars that have been happening and are happening and that we have to take a moment and a beat and it's right to take a moment and a beat to talk about these things but also important to note all the times we don't and all the black and brown bodies that we don't talk about and I'm personally really invested in Palestine I think it's yeah, you know what? Woo, yes. Yeah. Free Palestine. Free Palestine. Yeah. And it's really important, especially to talk about in the context of Russia and Ukraine, about sort of countries being colonized, countries being occupied. And there's a film called The Tale of the Three Jewels. And it's, you made me think of this. And it's about finding those small moments of pleasure, of joy, interspersed with the bombings, the raids, the imprisonments, and how in that world, joy is respite and both of these things are again transcendental in their own way to what you said about rising above about feeling outside of your own body you can feel those things with both, both pleasure and pain and they're both routes to get there i suppose um and i suppose there's no real point to like neatly round off all of this except to say you made me think of that and thank you and for all of this is so interlinked mm -hmm. and we can't escape any of it I think what's coming up, and I can, you know, sense when people's, you know, people are identifying with things that Amani's saying, Adelaide's been saying, is that we can't talk about joy without it verging pretty quickly into political material and deeper material and uncomfortable material as well. And I think that was the intention of choosing this as a year-long topic. And so many of the things that have come up so far. Um, I'm hoping, or we're planning, on creating more space for. So tonight we're touching on things in, in, in the version of the launch, but um, these are all huge conversations that we are devoting more space to. I'm going to move on to um, about talking to us a little bit about another angle to joy, which actually ties up with Amani's reference to love of the Medusa and some extracts of which are on the back of of um, the flyer and receipts. Um, so Daniela was going to talk a little bit about how Latin American women artists have used humor in their art practice as a form of resistance in patriarchy. And um, we have some images, Daniela, if there's one that you want to, we've got a few, we probably only have time to talk about one. So do you want to, which one would you like to talk about? Maybe there's one, or might just, well, we can talk about both if you do them, well, I think we'll uh, I love, 
particularly Monica Mayer and Mari Bustamante, I want to ask firstly, do any of you know their names? And, uh, and this is why we exist, <laughs> in a sense. Like, as it's an organization, uh, I belong to Interesco Amalgama. We are there to showcase the work of Latin American artists that, for example, like these two wonderful women that I found absolutely engaging, intellectual, and brilliant in so many ways. And, and the, back then, in the 1980s, they decided to use humor in order to communicate effectively in a society that doesn't want to listen. And, and in a society that it is through laughter, it is through joy that you listen. And specifically with this, this wonderful work that is called Mother for a Day, that is part of a series that they made together called Mothers. And it's, it's wonderful how they tackle it because they, they said, okay, we're gonna do this project called Mothers. And, and this is why we got pregnant. It's not the other way around. We didn't got pregnant and then decided to talk about motherhood, no. We actually, scientifically, we decided to get together and get pregnant at the same time because they, their pregnancies are four months apart. And then we had the collaboration from our husbands that decided to also participate and help us get pregnant. And they got pregnant with two women because they were feminists. They were the first uh, feminist collective in Mexico to, to actually name themselves like that. And this is why they also call themselves eh, Polvo de Gallina Negra, which is black hen dust. Correctly, which is a dust that they use to prevent evil eye. Because they said, being a woman, being a female artist, is difficult enough. This is why we need to sprinkle ourselves with a bit of joy yeah. in order to protect us from evil eye that comes with the job description, basically. And this is why they, they did this, and they went to a very popular show, TV show in Mexico in the 1980s, and they dressed the host of the show, and they said, Today you have been invested with the honor of being a mother for a day. And we chose you because you embody what we consider the right qualities to be a mother. And this is why we're also crowning you because a mother is also the queen of the household. Then you are left behind once the, you have the children and then the children take over and they are the kings or queens. And, and, so, and, and it's really funny how awkward it became because for him he was very awkward trying to make the most of this very funny situation, everybody was laughing, but in a way, it, it allowed them to speak about a subject that was taboo, that was, in a way, no one wanted to, not men, like, there's no one man in Mexico at that time that wanted to recognize what it felt to be a woman, how uncomfortable it is, and how uncomfortable it is to be pregnant and, with, and, and carry that weight, literally. Uh, so it was a very wonderful proposal that they did. And, and they used precisely that, laughter and joy, to tackle something that was quite serious, of course. And would you say that laughter and joy, I mean, we know that on numerous occasions, and even you said about how women who laugh, there's a monstrosity attached to it. Is there something about that specifically in a, what you might define as a patriarchal Latin American culture of women laughing? Is it? unseemly or has it been something that's frowned upon or excessive? I think maybe this idea of excessiveness is something that aspects of demonstrating joy can share and that kind of stepping outside of the traditional roles that are set for women. It's really funny that you said it's, it's, it's interesting because um, stereotypically Latin Americans, we seem to be very joyful, very loud, very musical and so on. But at the same time, we are embedded with this phrase that is calladitas te ves más bonitas. So if you're silent, you're pretty. Uh, so again, you are you have this powerful to be loud, to be, and if you go to a Latin American household, or I don't know if this affects like the same size of the whole Latin America, but where I come from in Colombia, you do feel like women are quite loud and they're vocal, but calladitas te ves más bonitas. So don't express your feelings so much. <laughs> And again, this is why their whole process was so wonderful because they were inviting these reactions, inviting people. And of course, a lot of men complained when they saw the show and they said, no, 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 what are you doing? Why are you putting him up? And then he finished by saying, okay, so we finished and now the macho arrives to the show. <laughs> and like he has to close saying, okay, my macho-ness is coming back because I felt like I was deprived of my macho for a few 30 minutes. Uh, so. It, you, you live within this tension, I, I, I feel. Yeah. I think 
just, I mean, my hands might be one more image. I know you have another one. Um, maybe oh. this is a good one to think about, um, so, which also takes us into yeah. complex territory of thinking about Freud and psychoanalysis and the misogyny of. I love my Lisa Samantha because I will invite you all to look for her, especially look for her describing her work. She's quite witty, she's quite intelligent, and the way that she describes everything is very joyful, it's very comical at the same time, but very intelligent, and I think that there lies her importance. She was part of another collective before Polvo de Gallina Negra, Polvo Grupo, uh, and one of their collectives, she did this performance that is called uh, Penis as an Instrument of Work. I don't know if I'm translating it correct. Uh, where she invited all these people to wear a mask of herself, wearing a mask <laughs> that is basically glasses with a penis, trying to um, like tackle this argument, Freudian argument, that women that pursue professional endeavors have penis envy. So let's, let's do that. Let's wear a penis and see if this is why we're reading yeah. or being intellectual. Yeah. Because I think partly one of the things that was making me think what you just said and, and, and your whole body of work is that I think this pressure to be intellectual, in a sense, for a lot of artists, like even myself, is precisely because we are we feel like we were forced to be emotional. We were forced to only express ourselves in this emotional being. And so being intellectual is something that we have to say, like, you know, I'm also intellectual. Like, <laughs> enjoy my brain as well as my body or my emotions. And I think this is what they were also tackling, this joy that also comes from thinking and being intellectual and reading and, and tackling all these notions. So I think this is why, particularly, this is a very interesting body of work of her as well. Amazing. It also, when I just looked at that, it looks kind of like the Mona Lisa with that last guy, <laughs> which is, um, you know, whether that's intentional or not, but it sort of takes on that, you know, the stereotype of the silent, mysterious, most famous woman of art history, Renaissance art history, you know, that's protected behind glass and leaf. Um, fascinating. We're gonna have time for questions in a moment. Um, so I'm going to say thank you to our amazing panel um, with a round of applause for their contribution. <laughs> terrain of how we can start to think about joy and as to how joy plays out in artist practice um, and in politics and the coming together of the two of them in this way. So are there any questions? Do raise your hands and a mic can be passed along to you. Um, I was just thinking about in terms of um, the politics of knowing joy after and um, also the pandemic and I think there's a lot of rage and anger and I'm wondering how or even, you know, with hip hop, you know, it's just all about sort of pain and how that feeds into joy, but I just find wondering how rage and joy, whether they're opposites or whether there are ways in which they intersect, um, because I think there is a lot of anger and rage and, and um, the way things play out in terms of um, society. Great question. Um, I think they're both this sort of Again, this idea of excessiveness, aren't they? This idea of bursting, of uncontainability. Any of my panel want to comment on rage and joy and being part of the same process? Not bad, really, just like, ah, uh, you know, rage and joy. Um, it's interesting because I feel like um, once you have an awareness, right, once you once you are um, in your mind and body aware of your emotions, and you can really tune in, you can, you can almost like in a chemical sort of thing, turn whatever into whatever you want, right? Um, and, uh, and you can do that with intention as well. And that's a very healthy way, actually, of dealing with trauma, with rage, with pain, is to intentionally feel what you're feeling. Because this is what <laughs> my goddess, <laughs> Miss Audre Lord, encourages us to do, actually, in her essay, Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic is Power. 
she encourages us to tune into, when she's talking about eroticism, she's not talking about um, pornography, she's not talking about sex. She could be, but not necessarily, right? She's talking, in, she's talking about tuning into how you feel. Tuning into how you feel in your body, whatever those feelings are, really tuning into them and understanding them. Once you do that, then you can you can like you can transmutate that thing into whatever you want, and that is that is good for your mental health. I think. But you can't if that's like if, if that's being predisposed by the patriarchy, then you can't. If that's primarily through a patriarchal perspective, then basically what you're saying is that women should be pushed at the point of five views of women, and that we should love and accept that. That's that's not what I'm saying. No, oh. but that is what you're saying, though. Because How? That is the primary perspective. Because men and porn are being like that comes through men. So I wasn't talking about porn. I specifically said at the beginning of what I, what I said that she, when she's talking about the erotic, she's okay, not talking so about like pornography. The, pornography is the opposite of the erotic. I feel like yeah, sure. I really hear your point in that woman who is there and then she says what that means, gender goes, and she says what that means, so then she offends you. There are notions of what that means. And I hear you, and it's really frustrating in that sometimes it feels like no matter what decision we make, we actually don't have agency because we exist in a system. And the system means that no matter what choices, decisions we make, from wearing a really hot waist under <laughs> to not, to wearing whatever you want, to doing your hair however you want, to choosing whether or not to wear makeup. That was always seen like really noble things. And it's hard to be in that world. But I also wonder, and maybe this is an aspect of joy, is what if we actually just had a minute, and again, not that we do exist in this world, but maybe joy is imagining what that world could be like. Or actually, what would I look like in a world where those constraints weren't put upon me? And I could do my hair however the fuck I wanted. Or I could or could not wear a waist binder or I could just be how I want to be. And it's hard, and I feel you, it's explosive. It's, it's really fucking frustrating. Uh, can I answer a bit? I was thinking of your question, actually, and, and it reminded me of someone that I, I talked to you about before, which is called Victoria Sartakuri. <laughs> uh, she's a wonderful artist, and she has a performer, a performance that is called Negrita or Negra, where she uh, it translates and they shout to me black or uh, like a no 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 negrito sino black they, they shout to me black and it comes from rage rage and it comes from a situation when she was a child where she acknowledged for the first time that she was black because before she just had friends and then a one person arrived and said I don't want to play with you because you're black and then she realized for the first time oh my god I'm black <laughs> and that does that means something. And then she, it, I, I, I really do encourage you to all look at it online because she starts from anger. She starts saying, and they shout to me black, and it, in a way it forced me to uh, comb my hair differently and see my self body image in a wrong way. But at the end, she said, like, you know what? And I'm black, and I love my hair, and I love the way I look. And in a way, it makes you all feel like, oh my God, I want to be like her. I want to be. I, I want to be you in so many ways, and how she transformed it through a wonderful performance that also included music and, and gesture and bodily gesture, and she had like a collective, uh, like a group of people joining her, and it, she transformed this joy, uh, rage to joy in a, in a way that at the end, like you feel empowered yourself, whoever you are, it described like your face, how, like how you look, regardless, it was something that made me think of. I could, yes, please. Sorry, it, I, we got into a rage and joy dichotomy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't intend with the question. But I think I just wanted to say what, um, what Emma and what everybody has said in response to that um, kind of made me think that that maybe there's a way, instead of take, you know, raging at the system, because, you know, as Emma was saying, there, there, is a, there are constructs and, you know, um, we can't escape the advertising ways of imagery and, and even if you think of yourself as, as liberated from that are you really because you grew up you know um, but
but maybe there's a way in instead of I mean because it is a religion, but maybe there's a way of I mean looking at panel of you know everyone is embodying a different vision of being a woman and being joyful, um, and maybe there's a way of celebrating that and 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 taking that rage and you know um, I don't know celebrating the way that other people embody it. Absolutely, and I think it speaks to Audre Lorde's um, quote that Adelaide sort of gave us about using that language to overcome difference in whatever embodiment of femininity, sexuality, womanhood, all of these constructs that have been constructed but also are being lived in different embodied ways by different people at all different times. So um, I think that's a really important thing of appropriating that rage and trans transforming it and maybe that's something fundamental to joys is transformation whether that's from trauma into into um, into a more expansive sensation in your body that that does not have to be sexualized you know I think that's the important thing here that a lot of time we think about female joy and female pleasure we automatically think of that as being something sexual and eroticized because those are the ex only examples of female pleasure that we are given um, in a kind of visual currency of visual culture. So to complicate that, to think about that in different ways, does touch on raw nerves. And I think you know it's it's good that this material is challenging and that it invites in these responses. There was a question somewhere there. I think it's the time for our last question before. Um, oh, there's two questions. Okay, now you've all started. Okay, all right, let's have um, on this side of the room and then over here. Thank you. Please come in. Good evening. Just want to say, all inspiring, really good. Um, question for Adelaide from anyone else. But Adelaide, I've seen your work before and your work now. How have you noticed the difference in your, or have you noticed a difference in how the audience interacts with your with your work that is focusing on the joy, like those powerful colours, compared to the amazing work you did before, which was about um, our history, your history? What difference have you seen? To be honest, um, this work was shown in Germany. It hasn't been shown in the UK, and um, I wasn't there, unfortunately, because the time when the show opened, Germany was literally going into lockdown, so I couldn't go. But um, I had some really great responses and feedback from the gallery, um, and uh, but the, that audience hadn't seen the work that I was doing before, so it's difficult to get that comparison. So it will be interesting to see when the work travels here finally, how people do interact with it, but just in terms of um, the people around me, uh, the friends and family, people who know my work, um, generally they, they have had very positive response to this to this body of work. Um, people who visited the show said that they felt at peace in and among the work um, because there are different chapters and this one's, okay, yeah, that one is different to the, the previous one. That one's a lot more subtle. So some of them, this one is from um, a chapter called Mysteries of Desire and um, the other one is Heavenly Bodies. And then there's another one that's called um, The Embodiment of Joy. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was interesting and it was refreshing. I like to call the whole series a palette cleanser for myself. Um, and I just wanted to actually just add one more point to the, the kind lady who um, <laughs> left the room before, uh, in terms of, of of what she was saying with regards to what Audre Lorde talks about with regards to the erotic. The, she's not talking about pornography. She makes that point very specifically in the work, right? She's talking specifically about you being in tune with the feelings of your body so that you can have an authentic human experience. And then she talks about understanding if you're a group of people, human beings, we're all different, right? If you uh, experience joy, right, with other people who are different to you, that joy forms a bridge. It forms a bridge through which you can then discuss and articulate the, the, the things that make you different, that you can use to fight the patriarchy and to fight whatever oppressive forces there are, right? So 
don't mis anyone misunderstand. Just because I'm sitting here wearing a corset, I chose to wear this corset today. Yeah, I don't wear a corset every day. I chose to wear it today because I like it. <laughs> and that's my choice. Yeah? I chose to wear makeup. That's my choice. Sometimes I decide to go around looking like a tramp. That's my choice. Today I just felt like it. So it is what it is. So let's celebrate our differences and use them as a tool. And also, can I just say that? I wonder why did we accept the plan doing it where yeah. they were using yeah. women as props exactly. and instead she's doing because she wants to explore her own, I think, sexuality even. Why, why is wrong saying that? Why is wrong allowing women to experience our own pleasure? In a sense, like, we were the pleasure for men and why can we not just be the pleasure for ourselves yeah. even if we just enjoy using our bodies as an object of desire for ourselves. Mm -hmm. like, I, 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 this is why I enjoy this work, because in a way it allows you to connect with that feeling of just enjoyment of your own body, whether it's there with someone, great, but also with yourself, I think. <laughs> To add to that as well, I like keep coming back to the love of the Medusa, which to some extracts are printed on the back of the fly, but I really urge you to go and read that as well as Vicky Lloyd's work if you're not familiar with it, because um, Sixu talks about this idea of, um, of female sexuality, of experimenting with one's body and creating this new language. And of course, the only language we've had is the Eve Prime, is the sexualization of women, the exoticization of women. Um, but Maybe that's why we struggle to talk about these things, and that's why we need women artists and writers to explore these territories, because we don't yet have a fully comprehensible language to put them out there without it arousing sort of problematic debates. There's time for one more question, which I'm passing over to, and then I think we'll have to um, call it an evening, but there will be time to drink in the bar. And also um, urge you to think on to next month because we touched on lots of topics and next month's topic is um, erotic and sexual joy and unpacking that and problematizing it and thinking about the politics of that. But our final question, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I just had a question that um, continues off what you were saying, I believe, um, and this is for all the panelists, whether you think um, joy is personal or collective and maybe steering away from sexual joy that seems to be the most obvious, but in a broader sense of collective joy. Thanks. I mean, well, that's exactly what I was alluding to um, in that particular passage where Audre Lorde is, is speaking about, um, she, she's specifically talking about women getting together and knowing that you're different, whether that is you're white, I'm black, whether that, well, we, got, we both got kind of blondish hair, right? Um, but we may speak different languages, right? Um, and, and so it may be that, I don't know, we go out raving or something and we experience that joy of just dancing and being in our bodies and that's the thing that connects us. That is that shared joy. So that's what she's, she's speaking to and that can be a group thing, it can be a one-on-one -on -one thing, it can be between women, it can be between men and women, it can be between all genders, just all humans. Is she speaking specifically about the human experience of the, and, and this is, what I think where people are getting trapped is because she's taught, she specifically uses that word, the erotic, but she's flipping it on its head. This is 1978, so imagine how, how subversive that was at that time, where that word was specifically only used as related to sex, but she's not talking about it in relation to sex. She's talking about it in its opposite. She's talking about it, it, it could be, it could be you digging your hands into the earth, right? Because you're planting something. You're planting something and giving something else life. It could be you interacting with your children. It could be you interacting with your friends. All of those things in life that give you that feeling of joy, that joy is the bridge that forms the connection between human beings, and that's what we can use to fight whatever oppressive forces are against us. I hope that answers.
participar sobre isso. 